Thank you, Chad. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, this morning, and I hope you have your Bible with you, uh, to Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1. And what I want to do today is for you to just kind of, in your mind's eye, visualize. Now, we don't know what heaven looks like, but we're going to kind of go to heaven just for a little bit and, um, you know, kind of go behind the scenes of what's happening during this Christmas time with Jesus Christ coming into the world, you know. Sometimes people will go to a concert and they'll have a free pass to go backstage. They'll be able to go back and uh, uh, behind the scenes and see what all it takes to put together the production or whatever it might be that uh, the reason that you're there. So we're going to kind of go backstage today. I want us to just go to heaven on the Christmas Eve, on the night that Jesus Christ was born, on the night that he came down from heaven. I want us to, in our mind's eye, uh, to go back to that time. And so I want to speak to you today a few moments about preparing for Christmas, preparing for Christmas. You know, some people begin preparing for Christmas the day after Thanksgiving. They go to uh, all the sales that are offered, Black Friday and all that. Of course, things have changed differently, different this year, and, and people are ordering a lot of stuff now, you know, and picking it up or having it delivered, and, and I can understand all that. But we prepare for things. Now, all through the years in my time in the ministry, I've been at churches, and uh, <clears throat> there'd be a lot of work that would go into the, to the Christmas music, and of course, this year, normally, Chad and the choir would be out here practicing through the week and getting ready uh, to present the Christmas music, and the children would be involved, and and, of course, we can't do that right now. That's all changed, but we are going to offer you something, by the way, uh, uh, the Sunday before Christmas. But there's a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes, a lot of things that happen uh, before something is prevented, presented. And so we have, uh, like many of us, you start putting the decorations out, do you not? And so the first pretty day that after Thanksgiving or sometimes on uh, Thanksgiving Day, a lot of people will be out in their yards and they'll be uh, uh, decorating. And, and so when do you start preparing for Christmas? There are some people that go back three or four months and then some uh, wait to the last minute actually in preparation for a lot of, a lot of things. And so uh, every year it seems like that, that many people will say, well, I'm not going to put out as many decorations this year as I did last year. And then they start putting out decorations. I think, well, go down there in the basement and get that other box that we use, and we'll get a, a few things out of it. And the next thing you know, they've got more out than they had <laughs> uh, the year before. I'm sure that's happened to some of you all. So what I have learned to do, I've learned to kind of stay out of the way. <laughs> now, all through the years at churches, I've been pastor. You know, they would do uh, musicals and all that. And so what I do, I get me a bottle of Tylenol, and I just kind of stay away from all that. But there's a lot goes on behind the scenes. So much goes on that, that people actually don't know about. And then we have to prepare for the food, do we not? Many families will have children come in or others come in and, uh, uh, to eat with them. And so there's always that, do we have turkey this year? We had it at Thanksgiving. Do we have ham? And, and we go through all those things and... Uh, getting prepared for the Christmas time of the year. We buy gifts. You know, what do we get for someone? It's hard to buy for people. I, I know about a, this old boy just had uh, only been married about a year, and uh, so it was Christmas Eve, and, and he still hadn't gotten his wife anything for Christmas, and he saw that she was getting real upset because she kind of picked up on that. And so he told her that he had to run by the office for a few minutes, and he'd be, he would be back. But what he did that Christmas Eve, he went to Macy's. And while he was at Macy's, he went to the cosmetic counter, and he told this uh, clerk there, he said, I want some special perfume for my wife. And she showed him a bottle, and he said, how much is that? And he, she said, that's $250. He said, oh, no, no, no. He said, I'm not going there. Show me something else. And he said, that's way too expensive. So... Uh, she, uh, she got a bottle and brought back over, and she, he said, how much is that? And uh, she said, that's $100. He said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to spend that much. So they went back and forth with 50 bottles, and they got down to this $10 bottle that they brought him. And uh, he said, I, I'm not sure that's, if that's what I want or not. You know, he said, I want to see something that's really cheap and cheap. 
And she said, okay. So the clerk handed him a mirror. <laughs> I thought, yeah, there's a whole lot to that. So uh, don't go in debt this Christmas. You know, a lot of people will go in debt at Christmas and, and they spend half of the year paying it off. And so don't overextend yourself. You know, that's not what Christmas is about uh, anyway. The way you spend Christmas is far more important than how much you spend on Christmas. So use this time as a time of family gathering. Perhaps some of us will be able to uh, uh, together. But here's the main thing. Don't lose focus on what Christmas is all about. So I want you to look with me at uh, Luke chapter number one. And I want to share with you about going backstage, preparing for that first Christmas day. Uh, they're the right people. We're there in the right place. Now that did not happen by accident. This is all by God's divine design. As a matter of fact, in Galatians chapter 4, uh, Paul referred to that. He said, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. Now, Paul shared that over in the book of Galatians, and when he talked about when the time had come, he's talking about the right time. It was now time for God to send his son to Bethlehem to the right place to be born there. All this was decided long before Jesus Christ ever came to this earth. You see, he was with the Father before he came down from heaven. So he was born under the law. He was born there with the, with the right person. Uh, and so as we read the Christmas story, we see that God put all this together. So that's the reason I want us to, uh, to look at Luke chapter number one and kind of go behind the scenes and see what God did as he put all this together with you, <coughs> excuse me, with you and I in mind. Now, so in Luke chapter number one, we find an angel, we find uh, the angel Gabriel, and then we find uh, Zechariah, who was the priest, and we... Uh, uh, then we see Elizabeth as well. So three people there at the first part of chapter number one in Luke. Now, Zechariah was a priest, and he was serving there in the temple. He was married to uh, Elizabeth, but there was a problem there. They had no children, and they both wanted children. So pick up with me, if you would, Luke chapter one. We're going to begin reading with verse one, and then I'm going to pick out a few of these verses and kind of uh, break them apart so we can see the, what the real meaning of Christmas is and all that went on the, in the scenes behind Jesus Christ coming in to this world. So the Bible tells us there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abai, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, that's the priestly tribe, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. And then what else does it say there? It says they were blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And so it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense talking about Zechariah, his lot was to burn incense when he went to the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of the incense. And when Zechariah saw him, talking about Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, and when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fell upon him. What would you do if an angel appeared to you? <laughs> Probably the same thing that he did. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth, they've been praying for a child, see he and Elizabeth both, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and they shall call his name John. That's John the Baptist. Elizabeth was a cousin to Mary the mother of Jesus. And so John the Baptist was a forerunner of Jesus Christ, and they were also cousins as well. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this lesson today. And I just pray as we read these verses that we'll have a better understanding of, of what you were doing to bring Jesus Christ into this world. 
And so we know that there's a reason because we were separated from you because of our sins. We're born with a sin nature. We had no hope of heaven at the end of the way. But God, in your plan, you sent your son to go to the cross and pay a sin debt that we couldn't pay. And so, Father, when Jesus shed his blood on that cross, now when we come to you by faith, that blood covers our sins. Father, we just thank you and we praise you for that. So I just pray that you'll use these moments together, that we'll have a better understanding, perhaps, of the Christmas season and what all it costs God. It costs God his son. He gave the best that heaven had to offer for us, and we thank you for that. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Look with me, if you would, just for a few moments at verse number one, or verse number five, and I want to break down just a little bit, and we'll look at this lesson and see, uh, and see what God has to say uh, to us. Now, in verse number five, he said, There was in the days of Herod, the king of uh, Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of, Ab of Abiah, and his wife was the daughter of Aaron. Now, so we say, what's so important, all that? We kind of read right by that oftentimes when we're reading our Bible. We just go right by that. So when it says in the days of the king Herod, now this was a horrible king. He was a crafty, cruel Herod the king. He was from the line of Esau. We remember about them from, uh, from days gone by. Uh, that's the Edom Edomites, and they were a very bad group of people. And so he was in a family that was full of hatred, all across the centuries. This is who we're talking about when it talks about in the days of King Herod of Judea. Now he tells us also in verse 5, there was a priest of Abiah division named Zechariah. Now, during the reign of David, these priests had been organized and they then divided into 24, uh, 24 different groups. Now, can you believe this? In that day, get your mind focused on this, in that day there was about 20,000 priests but there was only one temple. And so they divided them up in 24 divisions. Zechariah was in the eighth division of this. And so they were, they were to serve one week twice a year because there were so many of them. And so this, the uh, priestly tribe that Zechariah was part of was the tribe of Aaron. That was the tribe of the Levites. They were the priestly uh, tribe. So that's very, very important. He goes on to tell us that his wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was religious, uh, was <laughs> Elizabeth. So what that's telling us is these were righteous people. These were parents who served God, who loved the Lord with all their heart. They were godly parents. So let me ask you a question today. As we read this and as we see the, the love these two had for each other, the desire they had for a child, which they're going to get a child, John, but here's what we see. We see godly parents here as we look at this. So let me ask you today, are you considered a godly parent? Do you read your, the Bible to your child at night or perhaps a, a grandchild that you're raising or at your house oftentimes? Are you, are you reading the Bible to them? Are you praying with them? You see, this couple here was a perfect match, and the Bible says that they were godly parents. Uh, godly parents. They were going to be godly, they were godly people. Do you know our kids are going to suffer because of all that's going on right now this, with this pandemic? It's going to be tough on our kids of all times for parents that should, be, that should be reading the Bible to their children at night and praying with their kids and helping their kids through this. Here, this is what we must be doing because this is very difficult for these kids. And so, do you read the Bible with your child? Are you talking to your child about Jesus? Are you telling them about the real meaning of Christmas? Or, or do they see you wrapped up in the gifts and all this other stuff, and they miss that? You see, we need to teach our children these things. So the Bible tells us here that they were both in right standing with God. They were righteous people. But there was something missing in their life. There was something wrong in their life. And uh, look at verse number 7, and it's going to tell us what was missing they had a heavy heart because she had no children. He said they had no children because Elizabeth was barren. They both were now well stricken in their years. Now, if we go back about 700 years prior to this, prior to this, we'll see where the Bible tells us about all this stuff that we're looking at today is going to take place. 700 years before it was predicted all this stuff would happen. And so now we see it getting ready to happen. 
Galatians said, the fullness of time have come. Now, could you imagine in heaven, let's just kind of venture up there, let's kind of venture up there for a few minutes and look at, back, at the backstage and see the preparation that was made for Jesus Christ coming into the world. So could you imagine uh, Christmas Eve in heaven? So that's what I want us to center in on just for a few minutes. Because most of our thoughts about Christmas center on what? They center on the earth, do they not? We think about earthly things, what things that takes place on earth. That's what we see here. We read about Zacharias, Elizabeth, and John, and all that. John the Baptist, who was a forerunner of Jesus Christ. Well, I want us to go backstage and see the preparation that God was making for his son coming into the world. So you know what? I think that if I'd have been in heaven with that group that day, all those Old Testament people, I think my heart would have been anxious as well. And I think that I would have been there just watching as all of heaven, I believe, was watching at that time. Now, could you imagine this? Abraham is up there in heaven. Abraham, he could kind of identify with Jesus Christ as Jesus Christ was leaving the heaven to come to this earth. Now, if you remember Abraham, he's from Haran, and he left his homeland. He left everything there where he'd been raised up all of his life. He left all that to go to a place that he didn't know where he was going. He didn't know how God was going to use him, but by faith and obedience, then Abraham left. So he kind of knew what it was like when he sees Jesus Christ leaving heaven. You know, obedience catches the eye of God. Disobedience comes with a price. And so Abraham was obedient. And so as he looks at Jesus Christ leaving heaven to come to this earth, he sees this Jesus Christ uh, stepping out in obedience to the will of God the Father. Imagine old Isaac, if you would. Think about Isaac. Isaac was the son of Abraham. And you remember that? He carried on his back going up to Mount Moriah, going up there and and Isaac was going to offer him as a sacrifice because this is what God asked for. But you know what happened when he got there? God provided. You remember that beautiful story we have back in the Bible, in the Old Testament? God provided a ram there in, in the thicket. And so Abraham offered up that ram as a sacrifice to God. And so now God is providing a sacrifice for the world. He's offering his son. So I imagine that Isaac, as he thought about what happened in his life and the sacrifice that was to be made there and how God provided, and now God is providing a sacrifice for you and I who live here in this world. We're separated from God. We have no hope whatsoever of heaven at the end of the way. But God had a plan and a purpose, and his son was going to come and shed his blood. You see, blood represents life, and he was to come and shed his blood. And so God is going to provide a sacrifice for the world. And what is that sacrifice? He is offering his son. Now think about old Moses. I love to read about the story about Moses. Go back in the book of Exodus. He was a, the leader of the children of Israel. He had a stiff-necked bunch of people. And so we know through the story of Moses that as he was leading the children of Egypt, Egypt out, they were to have a Passover. They would take the a Passover lamb. They were to take the, the blood from that lamb and they were to put, what, were to put that on the doorpost and over the, uh, the door of their home. And the death angel would come through and when he would see that, they would come under the blood and so he would pass over them. Think about him as he thought about that, as Moses thought about that time and then he thinks about that Jesus Christ is a Passover lamb. And he probably thinks about the, about the sacrifice that was made. You know, there's another character that we see in the lineage as you read the genealogy of Jesus Christ. You see a lady by the name of Rahab. A, Rahab was a harlot from Jericho. But you remember what she did? She protected the spies that Joshua had sent in. There were two spies, and she hid those spies on the, on the rooftop of her house and uh, because there were those there in Jer Jericho who would have killed those spies. And so then they told her, after she let them down to escape, they said, hang in your window a scarlet thread, and when we come back to take Jericho, when the children of Israel, then that will be a sign to us not to destroy your home. 
And that's exactly what she did. So I imagine Rahab, as she stood there in heaven, as she was watching down on the earth as Jesus was getting ready to leave, I'm sure that she probably thought about that as a picture of Jesus Christ and his deliverance for us. Imagine Isaiah. Oh, Isaiah was called to be a prophet, was he not? And he would be watching, and he had prophesied 700 years before the night that we're talking about when Jesus came into the world. He prophesied that. He said a virgin would conceive and would give forth a son. He would be wounded for our transgressions. So imagine, just imagine there in heaven on Christmas Eve as Jesus Christ was leaving heaven to come to this earth, all the things behind the stage, all the things that that took place before Jesus Christ came into this world. 700 years before, Isaiah predicted that, and now the night had come. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, is a very beautiful verse. So we imagine Jesus Christ as he turned to his Father as he was getting ready to leave heaven. And he said, a body you have prepared for me. You see, God took care of all the backstage stuff. He took care of all that stuff when he brought his son into the world. So let me ask you a question today. Do you have any needs? Do you have any needs this Christmas season? Is there some needs in your life? Are there some things that you're, that you're dealing with right now that's too big for you perhaps and and it keeps you upset perhaps all the time. Maybe it's a physical thing. Maybe you're going through some surgery or been through surgery or, or whatever it might be. Maybe it's a family matter. Maybe it's a, ch- a wayward child or someone. And you're going through some stuff right now that, that, that's overwhelming you. It just feels like that, that it's taking over you. Why don't you do the same thing that Zacharias and Elizabeth did? Two righteous people here who were married, they had a need that only God could fill that need. Let me tell you, friend, God specializes in the impossible. I don't know what's going on in your life right now, but you know, and God knows. And oftentimes we try to work it out ourselves. We try to take care of this need ourselves when we have a God in heaven. So let me remind you that God specializes in the impossible. He does those things that that no one else can do. And he's interested in everything about your life and my life as a child of God. Now, you know, as I studied this lesson uh, at, to prepare it today, I thought about nowhere here does it ever say that, that Zacharias or Elizabeth ever whined or complained. They didn't gripe and moan or go on and say, you know, we've been faithful to you and here we can't have a child. Why, why not, God? We've you know, why didn't you give us a child, God? We've, we've served you and all this, and, and why is this happening to me? Look at my neighbor down there. She's, she has a child, and, and she never goes to church. She never worships you. No, nowhere in there will you see any complaining, any whining, or anything. They just kept on praying. You see, they took their God-sized need to the, to the God in heaven. And people will say sometimes, well... I just have so little faith. Then why don't you take what faith that you do have to him? The Bible says God blesses mustard seed size faith. The Bible talks about us casting all of our cares upon him, 1 Peter chapter 5. Why? Because he cares for us. Jeremiah 33, 3, there's a word from the God. He says, call to me and I will answer you. You see, He's the only one who can meet that need in your life. And so oftentimes we waste time and we go to all these other places and and trying to find a a solution for our life or trying to find a care when we care when we have a God in heaven. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 5. What a step that Jesus was making. Think about this. Jesus Christ was leaving the splendor of heaven to come to the womb of a woman to be born in a stable there. So you see, there's so much behind this statement when he says, a body you have prepared for me. Now that word body is an interesting word there. It means a material substance. That's what the translation in the New Testament means. And so God stepped into a body of flesh 
to identify with us. He came down from heaven, fully God, but yet fully man. He came down from heaven, and he would become our sin barrier. Think about that. A body prepared, joined together is what that word prepared means, framed together. In other words, perfectly joined together. So he visited us. He did so as a baby. His birth birth was unlike any other. It was like ours accompanied by pain and struggle and that, but he wasn't born with clean sheets around him. He wasn't born in in a sterile environment. He was born in the dung and the filth of a stable, virgin born. You know, I just, I've never understood why some people just have trouble with a virgin birth. And yet, but they believe in the miracle of the natural birth. Think about this. How can two tiny specks of protoplasm be joined together, resulting in all the intrinsics of a nervous system, a respiratory system, a circulatory system, and a digestive system? Folks, that's a miracle right there. But yet there are many who will have questions about the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 7, 14. 700 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the prophet Isaiah talked about a sign. He said, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. So what happens when you see a sign? A sign points us to something else, does it not? If you're driving down the road and there's a sign that says danger ahead or road construction ahead, a sign points something else towards something else. So Isaiah told us to watch for a sign. A virgin would bear a son. That'd be a miracle. So our Lord is in backstage in heaven. Jesus is leaving heaven and he says, a body you've prepared for me. So Jesus took a, took a physical body so that one day that you and I may have that spiritual body, a perfect body. We're going to have a brand new body one day. And so he came to be with us so that one day we could, we could go be with him. He came to earth so that one day that we could go to heaven. One day, John chapter 4, Jesus says, his desire is to do the will of him that sent me. Think about that. He came to fulfill the plan that God had planned backstage and brought into this world. So Christmas Eve in heaven, what a night that would be. Just before the curtain rises, can't you see Jesus turning back to the Father and said, a body you have prepared for me. You know what he did? He was obedient. Are you obedient to God in your life? Are the things that you're doing in your life, is that pleasing to God? Is the way you conduct your life, is that that bringing honor and glory to the God? I'm afraid many Christians are not doing that. But Jesus Christ obeyed the Father. Think about this. He took him to Bethlehem when Jesus came down from heaven. Then he went to Egypt. Then he went to Nazareth. Then he went to Capernaum where he set up his headquarters. Then to Jerusalem. And then Jesus went to Gethsemane, and there he prayed, and he asked that this cup would pass from him. Nobody wants to die, but yet, not his will, he says, but thy will be done. And then the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, who came down from heaven, who went, that was born there in Bethlehem, and later was down in Egypt, and Nazareth, Capernaum, and Jerusalem, and now we see him at Golgotha's hill. And there they hung him on a cross, And he died in your place and mine. And then they took him out and they put him in a grave. And the Bible tells us that he came out of that grave. And then one day he stood out there on the hillside and he said, I'm going back to heaven. He told the disciples, I'm going to prepare a place for you, but if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again. That where I am there you may be also. Many of you are like me. You have loved ones in heaven. My mother's been gone just a little over a year now, and my dad's been gone nine years, and I miss him so much, and my dad died on Christmas Day. But you know, as I think about that, and people say, does that bother you that your dad died on on Christmas days, you know? 
But you know, when I think about that, sure, I miss my dad and I love my dad, and, but I knew it was best that God take him on home and heal him. But you know, he got to spend Christmas with Jesus. And we have the promise, because of Jesus Christ, because he did the will of the Father, we have the promise that one day he's going to come back. Are you prepared for that? If he came today, are there things in your life that shouldn't be there? You'd be embarrassed to stand before him. Or maybe you would stand before him and your name wouldn't be in the Lamb's Book of Life. Has there been that time that you've invited Christ to come into your heart and forgive you of your sin? He came and paid that sin for you. It's paid for. And we come to the cross and say, Jesus, I'm sorry, I know I'm a sinner, and, and please forgive me and come into my heart. And he'll forgive us of our sin, write our name down in heaven. That's why I know that one day I'm going to be with my mom and my dad and my little brother again for all eternity because I trusted this Jesus Christ and what he did at Calvary's cross to be sufficient for my sin. So he was a sacrificial offering. Once and for all, he paid that sin debt. Father, I pray for these moments of invitation. Father, I pray if there be people out there today who under the sound of my voice or perhaps later watching this on the internet, if they've never been to that place in their life where they can go back and they know without a doubt that they were born again, born in the family of God, Father, I pray they'll make that decision today, not take a chance on putting it off another day. Father, we don't know when you're coming, but we know just as surely as you came the first time, you're coming again one day. We know, Lord, the sad thing is there'll be a lot of people unprepared for your coming. A lot of people with good intentions that one day they were going to make that decision. But they put it off. They believed the lies of the devil and they put it off and put it off until they were eternally too late. Father, I just pray for decisions that need to be made to you. Perhaps, perhaps those that need to be drawn closer to you to walk with you every day and to get into the Word of God and see what you have to say to us for every day. You have a Word every day for us because you know what we're going to deal with in a day's time. So Father, I pray in these moments if there's decisions that perhaps that, that someone else needs to make, maybe one of our loved ones, that we'll be praying for them right now during this invitation that God will use someone where they live, maybe in another city, maybe miles away, to be a witness to them. And I pray this in Christ's name.
and thank you, Chad, and thank you, musicians. If you've made some decision today, if you're watching by TV later on, uh, call me. I'll be here at the church this week, and let me pray with you, or let me rejoice with you, and uh, maybe send you some literature, or perhaps uh, uh, some Bible verses that will help you grow in the Lord. Thank you for being here this morning. Kathy Mills, uh, who's the leader of our Busy Hands, would like to meet with some of you ladies just for a minute. She'll be standing right outside of her car up here next to the building. She'd like to meet with you for a moment. And also let me share with you our Open Windows and Journey and Stand Firm. All those magazines are in. For many of you, you enjoy those. And so those magazines are in the foyer. You can just come in and uh, wear your mask and come in and, and pick up one if you'd like or come out through the week, whatever you want to do. Uh, they're here. Thank you for being here this morning. If you're visiting with us, uh, you're our special guest, and we're certainly glad you've come uh, to worship with us and look forward to your uh, next visit. Remember, there'll be no service tonight because the temperature is going to really get cold as soon as the sun goes down, but we've had a, a nice morning to worship together. Thank you, and may God bless you as you go.